At his wedding reception in June of 2020, professional ice hockey player Adam Gordet accidentally kicked his bride in the head during a failed dance routine. The Vancouver Canucks player had planned a striptease for his partner, Michaela. The shirtless and shoeless athlete thus danced in front of his seated bride as attendees looked on and clapped. He then turned around and tried to swing his leg over the woman's head. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to fully clear the rotation and clipped Michaela with his heel. Gordet quickly checked to see if his bride was all right, and the Massachusetts-based couple laughed off the incident. A clip of the failed dance was later widely shared on TikTok, with most users commenting upon the awkwardness of the situation and some complimenting Gordet's attentiveness towards his partner in the immediate aftermath. Number 8. Katie Mehta Texas photographer Katie Mehta was arrested while working at a wedding in Weatherford in November of 2018. According to official reports, a member of the wedding party had found Mehta having intercourse with a male guest. The inebriated 26-year-old was asked to leave, but instead of doing so, she fled to a nearby fountain and started yelling at other attendees. The authorities were called to the Parker Manor and verbally tried to get the woman to clear the premises. Meta, who also worked as a swimsuit model under the name Max McIntyre, persisted in her unruly behavior and walked to a tree on the property where she began to urinate. After she was taken into custody and on the way to the police station, she allegedly threatened the arresting deputies. Y'all's daughters are dead. Y'all's families will be dead by Christmas. Investigators believe that the woman's prolonged outburst had been influenced by her mixing Alprazolam, the generic version of Xanax and alcohol. Jail records indicated that she was charged with public intoxication and a felony charge of obstruction or retaliation. In 2020, Meta was sentenced to 18 months of probation, 60 days in jail, and 100 hours of community service. Number 7. Ramada Park Hotel Wedding Brawl The Ramada Park Hall Hotel in Wolverhampton, England, became the site of a massive brawl on October the 12th of 2019 that left several guests of an Indian wedding bloodied and battered. Footage of the fight, which resulted in three people needing hospitalization, went viral in the aftermath. One of the attendees, identified as Aman Singh, later recounted that there were punches flying all over the place. The footage showed multiple men, a few of whom were bleeding from their heads, striking each other as guests pleaded with them to stop. Another attendee, who was not named, expressed disappointment with how the wedding had ended, adding that those involved were animals. The police were called to the scene at around 9.30 p.m. but didn't arrest anyone. The reasons behind the conflict weren't disclosed, but the wedding party reported that they were hit with a fine of over $100,000 for the damage they'd caused to the establishment. The married couple's family indicated that they planned to sue the hotel, alleging that their privacy had been breached by staff sharing footage of the melee online. They also maintained that there was a lack of safeguarding for the event, which they claimed was attended by 500 people. A spokesman for Ramada Park described their statements as ridiculous and entirely fabricated. Number 6. Gladys Rickart On September the 26th of 1999, New Jersey woman Gladys Rickart was standing in the living room of her Ridgefield home, accompanied by her bridesmaids and taking some last-minute photos before she was due to get married. A limo was expected to take her to a chapel in Flushing, Queens, where she'd tie the knot with fellow accountant James Preston Jr. Shortly before meeting him, 39-year-old Rickard had ended a seven-year-long relationship with prominent Dominican-American businessman Augustin Garcia, whom she'd reportedly caught cheating with her best friend. Rickard was committed to moving on with her life, but Garcia was unwilling to accept the breakup. He consistently harassed her at one point, leaving a Bible on her doorstep and white roses on her lawn, described as a symbol of death in Dominican culture. On Rickard's wedding day, Garcia drove to her residence from his Washington Heights home, clad in a suit and carrying a briefcase. As he made his way into the house, he told the woman's relatives and friends that he was there to congratulate her. Garcia moved through the crowd and approached Rickard as she was handing bouquets to her bridesmaids. 
He brandished a revolver from his briefcase and opened fire on his ex-girlfriend. Three of the five bullets struck the bride-to-be in the head, spine and upper arm. A 10-minute video of the horrific incident was captured by a guest and Rickard later died from her injuries. Her brother tackled Garcia as he tried to reload his gun and held him down until the police arrived at the scene. In the trial that followed, Garcia's defense argued that his had been a crime of passion and that he'd become temporarily insane. Upon finding out that Ricard was getting married only months after they'd broken up, he was, however, found guilty of first-degree murder and in 2002 sentenced to life in prison with parole available after 30 years. Number 5. Cake Smashing Incident In April of 2022, a clip of a cake smashing incident at a wedding in the US went viral after the bride was left bleeding in its wake. The tradition commonly involves the newlywed couple playfully mushing cake into each other's faces, but on the day in question, it went horribly wrong. The video shared by TikTok user Iris Betsy Martinez showed the groom smashing a slice into his wife's face. The woman unsuccessfully attempted to retaliate, at which point the over-enthusiastic groom mushed the entire top tear into her head, causing her to fall backwards on the floor. Afterwards, one of the guests pointed out that the bride was bleeding on her dress. Attendees then discovered and tended to a cut on her arm, believed to have been inflicted by the groom as he was still holding the cake knife at the time of the ill-fated smashing incident. The clip was viewed millions of times on the social media platform, with many users being critical of the man's behavior through comments that underlined it wasn't a promising start to their marriage. Number 4. Matthew Amos 31-year-old Matthew Amos was arrested at his own wedding in November of 2018 after assaulting a teenage waitress who'd been working the reception. While at the Northampton Valley Country Club in Philadelphia, Amos had approached the victim allegedly asking her to go outside and make out, offering her $100 to do so. When she refused, the groom followed her into a restroom where he groped her and exposed himself. The teenager managed to push him away and fled. Officers were called to the country club a few hours later after Amos had punched a staff member who'd tried to stop him from taking alcohol outside the venue. The groom ignored the police's requests and began arguing with them before boarding a shuttle bus near the club. Officers then climbed aboard as well with their tasers drawn and took Amos into custody on a plethora of charges that included indecent assault, harassment, disorderly conduct, and resisting arrest. During the legal proceedings that followed, the teenage victim he'd assaulted was described as highly traumatized by the assistant district attorney. Amos' wife, Kayla, remained the most prominent supporter of his innocence throughout the highly publicized case and, in April of 2019, they appeared in court holding hands. A plea deal was drawn out by the man's legal team with consultation from the victim. Amos eventually pleaded guilty to misdemeanor charges of simple assault, indecent exposure and disorderly conduct in exchange for six years probation. Number 3. Eamon and Claire Goodbrand In the early morning hours of June the 24th of 2019, after what was reported as a day of heavy drinking, a brawl erupted at a wedding in Bathgate, Scotland. The newlyweds, Eamon and Claire Goodbrand, spent their wedding night in separate jail cells after they were identified as the main aggressors in the fight which took place at the View venue. The violence was sparked by a money dispute and Clear, at the time in her mid-twenties, launched a brutal attack on her mother, 44-year-old Cherry Ann Lindsay. The bride punched and kicked the latter in the head and body, hit her with a stiletto after she'd collapsed to the ground and seized her by the neck, restricting her breathing. Former professional boxer Eamon and his brother Kieran assaulted Lindsay's partner, David Boyd, he was repeatedly struck and grabbed by the neck while Eamon also pushed his thumbs into his eyes and bit him on the right ear and middle finger. The good brand brothers punched and kicked the event's DJ as well. When he tried to intervene, the fight eventually spilled into the venue's waterfront lawn and was captured on CCTV footage. The police were called to the scene and took the bride, groom and his brother into custody. The trio eventually pleaded guilty to assault and injury charges, but none of them was given jail time with their sentences involving 
community service and paying compensation to the victims in the incident's aftermath. Lindsay, who owned multiple properties, announced that she'd cut clear from her will after reportedly realizing that she and her new husband were only after her money. Number 2. Mavash Lagai Iranian woman Mavash Lagai, aged 24, and her husband had just tied the knot in July of 2022 when one of their guests decided to mark the occasion by letting off several gunshots. While officially illegal in Iran, the practice is accepted and to be expected during special occasions, much like in other Middle Eastern countries. During the ceremony held in the city of Furazabad, one of the guests fired an unlicensed high-powered hunting rifle. The first shot was released without incident, but the second went through the bride's brain and skull before striking two other male attendees. The guest survived with minor injuries, but Legay went into a coma and later passed away. The shooter, whom local police identified as one of the groom's cousins, fled the scene with the weapon but was later apprehended. His charges weren't immediately disclosed, but law enforcement vowed to take tough action against him and others found in breach of the rules regarding celebratory gunfire. Number 1. Radu and Philip Kordinayanu on January the 22nd of 2021, gunfire broke out during a wedding held at a country club in the village of Vlasovo in the Russian region of Moscow Oblast. Just hours before the incident, footage captured at the event showed the newlywed couple, Radu and Kristina Kordinayanu, enjoying the celebrations. Then, an argument erupted between two male guests on the bride's side at Radu, who was supported by his brother Philip. The motive for the dispute remained unclear, but as tensions escalated, the rowdy guests let off at least seven shots. The Kordinayanu brothers were struck and died at the scene. The suspects, only identified as brothers Alexei and Vladimir D, fled to Moscow in the aftermath. They were apprehended two days after the incident, while Kristina, who'd only been married to Radu for several hours, made a social media post honoring her late husband that included the words, How am I going to live without you? Number 11. James Valentine While on the job with Adler Tree Service in Gibsonia, north of Pittsburgh, James Valentine narrowly survived an accident that saw the razor-sharp teeth of a chainsaw come within a third of an inch from a vital artery. The 21-year-old was doing maintenance work on a pine tree when the chainsaw kicked back and cut into his shoulder and then his neck. His quick-thinking colleagues detached the blade from his motor and held it in place until first responders arrived at the scene. As an ambulance transported him to Allegheny General Hospital, Valentine was awake and responsive. The trauma center was alerted by paramedics that a man with a chainsaw blade in his neck was en route. It's an injury topology known to result in a damaged spinal cord, airway, or esophagus. Valentine was very fortunate, as he'd taken the brunt of the contact with the blade on the shoulder instead of the neck. The saw cut through the muscles and soft tissues, but stopped near his carotid artery, a vital vessel that supplies blood to the brain. Because of this, there was no major blood loss and Valentine was on the road to a full recovery. Number 10. Gregory Bulbuk In January of 2015, a Romanian tree surgeon suffered a fatal accident while working on a private property in Bermondsey, South London. 31-year-old Gregory Bulbuk was trimming a tree while suspended from a rope. As the chainsaw reached a harder portion of the tree, it kicked back into his neck. Bulbuk was nearly decapitated and bled out while still hanging from the tree. The chainsaw, which continued to operate, dangled from the man's body, no longer making contact with anything. A resident called the emergency services and other members of Bulbuk's crew used a ladder to bring his body down. The father of one passed away only a week from his 32nd birthday. Number 9. Pauline Pudney In 2005, a man from Eltham in southeast London accidentally killed his wife while operating a chainsaw on a ladder. 56-year-old Roland Pudney was using the power tool to prune bushes in his garden. His wife, Pauline, aged 57, was holding the base of the ladder, concerned about the risks that came with handling a chainsaw. The couple's dog then went after a golf ball that Pauline had previously thrown in the garden. It ran into the stepladder just as Roland had begun to cut into the tree. As he fell, the blade from his chainsaw struck his wife in the neck. Roland got up and saw that Pauline was bleeding and unresponsive. 
He called the emergency services and paramedics arrived to the property, but they were unable to revive her. A verdict of accidental death was recorded. The tragedy occurred just as Pauline was reportedly contemplating retiring so that she could spend more time with her husband. Number 8. Incident in Sydney In June of 2021, an Australian man suffered life-threatening injuries while cutting a tree with a chainsaw in Sydney's south. Emergency services arrived at Canterbury Grove shortly after 9am and were forced into haste action in order to save his life. The unnamed 32-year-old had been part of a group tasked with felling a tree in the area. His chainsaw suddenly kicked back, which is one of the most common and dangerous aspects of operating the power tool. A kickback occurs when the chain abruptly comes to a halt and forcefully throws the saw back towards the operator. The rapidly rotating blades plunged into the man's neck. He was bleeding profusely from a deep laceration and had also suffered cuts to his arm. Two teams of paramedics worked together and managed to stabilize him before he was transported to St. George Hospital. Number 7. Bill Singleton On May the 6th of 2016, Australian man Bill Singleton willed himself through surviving a harrowing chainsaw accident in which his face was split open. The 68-year-old was working at his property in Ballarat when he lost control of the power tool. It went into his head, cutting through his lower jaw. Singleton was unable to call for an ambulance because his tongue had been sliced in half. He got into his car and started driving to the nearest hospital. After wrapping his head together with bandages, Singleton reached a medical facility's car park but collapsed to his knees and recognized that he was starting to pass out. He forced himself to get back and reach the entrance. He was quickly airlifted to Royal Melbourne Hospital, where doctors determined that he'd cut into his head as far back as his wisdom teeth. The chainsaw had knocked out a few of his teeth, but fortunately stopped before reaching the carotid artery or the larynx. One of Singleton's doctors compared treating the injury to a gunshot wound, commenting on the dangers of operating a chainsaw. Once contact with skin is made, it continuously grabs on tissue, going deeper and deeper. After extensive treatment, Singleton was released from the hospital and continued to recover at his home. He told a media outlet that the accident hadn't deterred him from operating chainsaws in the future. Number 6. Greg Norman Australian golfing legend Greg Norman suffered a horrific chainsaw accident in September of 2014 which nearly cost him his left hand. Norman, who was professionally nicknamed the Great White Shark, had been doing DIY work around his Florida home. A few days prior to the incident, he'd posted a picture to his social media of him using a chainsaw to trim a plant on his property. It's believed to have been the same power tool that ultimately inflicted a deep cut to his limb, although Norman didn't comment on the particularities of the accident. A subsequent Instagram post would show him lying on a hospital bed hooked up to monitors and tubes. In the post, the 59-year-old told his followers how lucky he felt to have not lost his hand while also urging them to be respectful of the unexpected when handling chainsaws. Number 5. Scott Palmer For roughly two years after moving to a neighborhood in Barnsley, South Yorkshire, Jessica Appleby had been feuding with her neighbors. She attributed the recurring conflicts to her not fitting in with the lifestyle on the street. Then in May of 2017, the mother of one and her partner, Dean Brown, were involved in a massive brawl just outside their home. It escalated from an argument in the front garden to a fistfight in which Brown and neighbor Scott Palmer, a chief aggressor in the confrontation, exchanged punches. Appleby and another woman then grabbed each other by the hair before wrestling on the ground in the street. In the filmed altercation, witnesses egged them on and children were heard crying in the background as the brawl had seemingly started to die down with those involved content to trade accusations rather than blows. Palmer emerged wielding a chainsaw. He was recorded making his way towards the couple's home and reportedly shouted, Here's Chucky! Referencing the character from the Child's Play horror film. Brown managed to kick him out and block the door, thus preventing him from harming Appleby and her son. In the aftermath, Palmer was charged with the fray, having an offensive weapon and criminal damage to property, and jailed for 24 months. Number 4. Adam Baldock In 2011, Adam Baldock was working as a tree surgeon for a company called Acacia, based in Kent, England. 
on the day that he was celebrating his third anniversary with his girlfriend. The 27-year-old was on the job in Mitcham, Surrey. He'd climbed a tree and was trying to cut down a large branch. It's believed that he'd pushed it back too far, causing it to spring back and launch the chainsaw into him, blade first. It ripped into the left side of Bulldog's neck, causing him to fall 20 feet from the tree. Residents called the emergency services after hearing a blood-curdling scream that echoed through the neighborhood. In spite of paramedics' resuscitation attempts, Bulldog succumbed to his injuries at the scene. Number 3. Mal Wilhelm In 2017, Perth man Mal Wilhelm nearly died after the tree he was cutting changed direction and fell on him, pushing the chainsaw he was operating into his body. The 52-year-old was cutting the tree for firewood on his remote Chittering property when he found himself crushed beneath the weight of the tree. It took the paramedics three hours to reach him, a time during which Wilhelm wasn't sure that he was going to survive as he could feel his lung filling up with blood. Aside from the lacerations inflicted by the power tool, Wilhelm also suffered broken legs, a fractured spine, and a compressed rib cage. He was taken to the Royal Perth Hospital and placed in intensive care. He had a special filter inserted into his veins to stop a blood clot from migrating into his lungs. The device that ultimately saved his life measured roughly 25 millimeters and had prongs reaching out from the center of the filter. Its successful application was used as an example in a study that looked to widen its use with patients suffering from extreme trauma. Number 2. Melengi Guala On March the 6th of 2018, triathlete Melengi Guala was the victim of a horrific attack that occurred while he was trained in near Durban, South Africa. Three men pulled him from his bike, held him at gunpoint, and dragged him into some bushes. Then, using a chainsaw, they tried to cut off his legs below the knee. It's believed to have been a targeted attack, deliberately meant to cripple him ahead of the national championships, which were due to start in 10 days' time. Even after Guala had given the assailants his wallet and cell phone, they continued to cut through his right calf. They got about halfway through damaging his muscles, nerves, and bone before moving to his left leg. Guala would recall that the men spoke in a language he didn't understand. They ultimately relinquished the attack, and it's believed that they'd only done so because the chainsaw was too blunt to finish the job. In agony, Guala crawled to the road where he flagged down a car and was taken to a local hospital. Doctors believed that his legs could be saved. A crowdfunding effort was initiated, aiming to get Melengi back on his bike, while the full scope of the motive for the attack remains unknown, as does the identity of his attackers. Number 1. Incident in Romania In the winter of 2016, an unnamed 49-year-old Romanian man was cut in firewood in a village of Iasi County, located in the country's northeast. He called a neighbor to help him, and they shared a few alcoholic drinks before starting the chore. He warned his 53-year-old friend to be careful while operating the chainsaw. Then, as a joke, the neighbor lunged forward with the power tool in hand as, simultaneously, the other man stepped forward. The chainsaw ended up in his groin and tore apart the father of three's genitals. His wife suddenly saw him covered in blood and called for an ambulance. The victim was rushed to the hospital, where doctors were able to stabilize his condition and struggle to save as much of his manhood as they could. The man survived, but the future implications of his injury remain unclear. His wife stated that she intended to press charges against the neighbor, who was distraught in the aftermath, insisting that he was only trying to make a joke. Number 7. Colin Reeves on November the 21st of 2021, a former commando killed his neighbors in the village of Norton, Fitzwarren, Somerset, England, following what was reported as a long-running dispute over parking. Chilling footage later released by the authorities would show 35-year-old Colin Reeves jumping over the fence and onto the property of Jennifer and Stephen Chapel, both in their 30s. As the couple's children slept upstairs, he fatally stabbed each of them six times with a ceremonial dagger that had been given to him upon leaving the army. Minutes later, Reeves called the police to report the crime, telling the dispatcher, I went round with a knife. I've stabbed both of them. Ten days before the double homicide, the former soldier had berated Jennifer outside her home following an earlier exchange that she'd had with his wife, Kaylee, about designated parking in the area. After he was taken into custody and during the ensuing trial, Reeves admitted manslaughter but denied murder on the ground of diminished responsibility, maintaining he was not in the right state of mind at the time of the attack. 
Prior to leaving the army in 2017, Reeves had toured Afghanistan with the Royal Engineers and lost friends in the conflict. Reeves added that he didn't have time to decompress following his tour and insisted that he didn't remember the attack on the chapels. He told the court he'd been trained to kill and that his instincts were triggered by a bright white flash from a security light on the day. He remembered feeling that he had to protect his family from impending danger. While in prison, he was assessed by a forensic psychologist who determined he suffered from depression, anxiety, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Reeves was nevertheless found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 38 years served in June of 2022. Number 6. Tyler Griffiths after leaving the army, following a service of four years, British man Tyler Griffiths developed a serious drug problem and amassed considerable debts in the process. The 22-year-old eventually turned to crime to cover what he owed. On February the 10th of 2019, he wore a balaclava on his face and walked into a mini market in Halifax, West Yorkshire, armed with a kitchen knife. CCTV captured him instructing a female shop assistant who was working alone to surrender money from a cash drawer after he'd unsuccessfully tried to pry it open. He told the woman, don't call the police or I will kill you before making off with over $800. Griffiths had neglected to cover his hands, which featured distinctive tattoos during the robbery. CCTV photos of him handling the cash were distributed by the authorities and he was soon identified. He was arrested in March and subsequently pleaded guilty to armed robbery for which he was jailed for three years in May. In addition to the robbery, Griffiths also admitted four shoplifting offenses, common assault, burglary, possession of cocaine, and possession of a knife. A week after the Halifax robbery and before tips led to the police learning his name, he'd grabbed close to $130 from an unattended cash drawer at a Harrogate shop. While making his escape, he pushed the 75-year-old shop owner into shelving. His lawyer told the court that Griffiths regretted to have squandered his good character and his opportunities in life and pointed to the drugs as the root cause of his offending. Number 5. Thomas Mixon On February the 26th of 2018, a former Navy SEAL was arrested by law enforcement in Austin, Texas, in connection to five bank robberies in the area carried out since December of the previous year. During his eight-year service, Thomas Mixon instructed a Navy SEAL conditioning course. In 2007, Austin Fit magazine included him on a list of the city's 10 fittest. Investigators believe that the former soldier's criminal activity began on December the 22nd of 2017, when he robbed the IBC Bank in West Austin. He fled in a dark gray pickup truck and hit the same bank again on January the 5th. The third and fourth robberies happened at the Prosperity Bank on Northland Drive west of Mopac Expressway on February the 1st and the 7th. Witnesses' description of the suspect matched that of the person involved in the previous two incidents, while CCTV footage from two robberies indicated they'd been committed by the same perpetrator. The last heist took place on the same day that Mixon was arrested after a witness provided law enforcement with his license plate number. Shortly after he'd fled from Plains Capital Bank on North Mopac near Palmer Lane, the police took him into custody at his home in Northwest Austin. While he was walking towards his truck, inside the vehicle they found the black leather satchel that multiple witnesses had spotted on him and inside his home they found plastic bags identical to the one used in the first robbery. On April the 17th of 2019, Mixon pleaded guilty to five federal counts of bank robbery and was sentenced to 97 months in prison with an additional five years of supervised release. Number 4. Joseph Manuel Hunter From 1983 to 2004, Joseph Manuel Hunter served in the U.S. Army where he led air assault and airborne infantry squads, became a master drill sergeant and a sniper instructor. Hunter left the service as a sergeant first class, prolific in a vast variety of weapons and operational procedures. The man, nicknamed Rambo, subsequently began recruiting former soldiers from international armed forces. He put together an elite team of mercenaries in the early 2010s to serve as 
bodyguards and assassins for a Colombian cartel. The mercenaries' team's activities spanned the globe, from guiding a meeting in Mauritius to securing a ship in the Bahamas that was loaded with close to 700 pounds of cocaine and destined for New York. For his Colombian contacts, Hunter orchestrated a plot to kill a drug enforcement agent and an informant within the cartel. Two of his accomplices, former German corporal and elite sniper Dennis Gogol and former U.S. Army Sergeant Timothy Van Vakaius, agreed to kill the agent in exchange for $700,000. Unbeknownst to Hunter, his cartel employers were confidential sources to the DEA, who were recording their communication. Hunter was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the assassination plot and other crimes related to the Colombian connection. Gogol and Van Macias were also arrested and charged, as were two other members of Hunter's team, former Polish counter-terrorism expert Sloomir Zoborowski and former German military sniper Michael Filter. Hunter was given an additional sentence of life in a federal prison in 2019 for a previous contract killing. In 2012, he'd paid assassins Adam Samir and Carl David Stilwell, both of North Carolina, $35,000 each to kill a woman in the Philippines. He provided them with weapons and information about the unnamed target. Samir and Stilwell executed her on February the 12th of 2012 and then dumped her body on a garbage pile where it was found by local authorities. After receiving payment, they structured discreet wire transfers back to the US. Both were arrested in July of 2015 and, like Hunter, later sentenced to life in prison. Number 3. Craig Woodhall British health worker Victoria Woodhall was brutally stabbed to death outside her home in Middlecliffe, a small hamlet of South Yorkshire, England, on March the 29th of 2020. The woman's husband, former soldier Craig, had a history of controlling and abusive behavior towards her. She'd at one point confided in a friend that he'd thrown her phone and pushed her. After the couple had become estranged, Craig sought reconciliation, but the effort was reportedly interrupted by more hostility, including one incident in which he'd tried to get Victoria arrested over allegedly breaking coronavirus lockdown rules. On March the 29th, the woman's neighbors alerted the authorities that Craig was chasing her around her property. Before law enforcement reached the scene, the former soldier slashed and stabbed the woman with a kukri machete in a gruesome attack that was witnessed by several people. Victoria sustained injuries to the head, neck, and upper body, which proved fatal. Woodhall fled the scene in his car but was later arrested. The 41-year-old admitted murder and in early October of 2020 was jailed for 18 years and six months. Number 2. Benjamin Sifrit In 1997, Benjamin Sifrit completed the basic underwater demolition SEAL Training Class 212, but later had his Navy enlisted classification combatant swimmer revoked. He was discharged for poor performance, insubordination, and repeatedly being absent without leave. He also harbored extremist beliefs and had a white supremacist symbol tattooed on his chest. In 1998, he married Erica Elaine Grace when they were both 20 years old and moved near her hometown in Altoona, Pennsylvania. During Memorial Day weekend in 2002, they met another couple, Joshua Ford and Martha Crutchley, who were visiting from Virginia. After partying together at a nightclub in Ocean City, Maryland, the four went back to the Sifritz condominium. While there, they accused the tourists of stealing Erica's purse and threatened them with a gun. Ford fled to the bathroom where he was fatally shot four times with a gun subsequently determined to have been Erica's. Crutchley was murdered as well, but her cause of death remained unclear, with stabbing as the leading hypothesis. The Sifrits cut up the couple and then threw their remains in a dumpster in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, from where they were moved to a landfill and later found by searchers. A few days after the double murder, the Sifrits were caught trying to burglarize a Hooters restaurant, at which point law enforcement found driver's licenses belonging to Ford and Crutchley in Erica's possession. She would tell law enforcement that her former soldier husband had come up with the idea to rob and kill the tourists. During Benjamin's 2003 trial, a woman named Melissa Selling told the court that the Sifrits had put her through the same ritual as they had the slain tourists, but she'd managed to avoid being killed by them. 
Benjamin was only found guilty of second-degree murder for Crutchley's death and given a sentence of 38 years in prison. Erica was found guilty of Ford's first-degree murder and Crutchley's second-degree murder for which she was sentenced to life plus 20 years. Number 1. Eddie Ray Routh During his service as a US Navy SEAL sniper, Chris Kyle served four tours in the Iraq War and was awarded numerous commendations for acts of heroism, including the Silver Star. He had over 150 confirmed kills throughout his service, becoming the most prolific sniper in the history of the US military. After being honorably discharged in 2009, he published his best-selling autobiography, American Sniper, which was later made into an eponymous movie. Kyle also dedicated his time towards working with veterans. On February the 2nd of 2013, he and his friend, 35-year-old Chad Littlefield, went to a shooting range in Erath County, Texas. They'd taken 25-year-old Eddie Ray Routh, a US Marine Corps veteran, with them hoping the trip would help with his post-traumatic stress disorder. It served for seven years, including in Baghdad, and had been honorably discharged in 2011. Routh was in and out of hospitals for the following two years, experiencing PTSD from his time in the military, as well as auditory hallucinations and paranoia, which clinicians determined were connected to drugs and alcohol abuse. He was offered inpatient treatment at a veteran's hospital, but declined and stopped taking his medication as they were heading to the shooting range, Kyle texted Littlefield, this dude is straight up nuts, referring to Ralph, to which Littlefield replied by asking the former sniper to watch his back. Upon reaching their destination, the two went down range to set up targets. Moments later, Ralph opened fire on them, using two handguns owned by Kyle. The latter and Littlefield had pistols on them, but they were holstered and with the safety on. They didn't have time to react and were shot dead. Ralph was caught by Texas authorities after engaging them on a short freeways chase while driving Kyle's Ford F-350 truck. He was held on two counts of capital murder. A few months after the incident, while in jail, he told the deputy that he'd shot the two men because they hadn't talked to him, adding, I'm sure they've forgiven me. During Ralph's trial, his defense argued he'd been insane at the time of the killings, but two forensic psychologists testified to say they believe he was faking schizophrenia. One of them opined that he suffered from paranoid personality disorder exacerbated by drugs and alcohol. He was eventually found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 8. Isidro Zarate 39-year-old Isidro Zarate of San Antonio, Texas, took a trip to Walmart with his wife, Lisa Benavides, on November the 25th of 2016. It being Black Friday, the parking lot was filled to the brim with eager shoppers. Zarate dropped his wife off at the front of the store and proceeded to circle the lot while she was inside. As he awaited her return, he noticed a man attacking a woman. The assailant was later identified as 21-year-old Teles Mandan Juarez, who had grabbed his victim by the hair and was punching her repeatedly. It's unclear if there was any connection between them. Zarate pulled up in his vehicle and pleaded with him to stop. Juarez did let go of the woman, but only to reach for the firearm he was carrying. He fired multiple shots in Zarate's direction, striking the Good Samaritan in the neck and killing him. A stray bullet also hit a bystander, though her injuries were not life-threatening. Juarez swiftly fled the scene, but was eventually tracked down by San Antonio police, 10 miles from the Walmart. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. Number seven. The Sacramento Mall shooting On November the 27th of 2020, Black Friday shoppers at the Arden Fear Mall in Sacramento, California were startled by a sudden eruption of gunfire. Employees at the mall reported hearing roughly a dozen gunshots echoing through the establishment. At around 6 p.m., two brothers were killed in the shooting. Dwayne James Jr., aged 19, and Saquon Reed James, aged 17, were fired on by 18-year-old Demario Beck at a bank outside the mall following a verbal altercation. Dwayne was dead by the time authorities arrived at the scene, while Saquon was transported to a nearby hospital, ultimately passing away hours later. As they heard the sound of gunfire, shoppers looking to take advantage of Black Friday deals started collectively fleeing for their lives. 
large crowds of people flooded into the back rooms of various stores in an effort to hide from the shooter. Fortunately, no one else was injured that night. Within a week of the incident, Beck was charged with the murders of the two James brothers. Number 6. Patrick Henry Boyd On November the 29th of 2013, Patrick Henry Boyd of Clover, South Carolina, took four of his friends on a Black Friday shopping excursion to Concord, North Carolina. The group set out in the early hours of Friday morning in an effort to avoid the massive Black Friday crowds. It was still quite early in the day when they finished up their shopping and got back out on the road to return home. Unfortunately, because he'd gotten little rest, Boyd ended up falling asleep behind the wheel of the Honda Accord that carried him and his four passengers. The car drifted off the road and collided into a sign in front of a gas station. Boyd was killed on impact, while all four of his friends were subsequently taken to the hospital, with two of them having suffered serious injuries. One of the passengers later told police that Boyd had complained he was too tired to drive prior to losing control of the vehicle. Number 5. The Reno Walmart Shooting Black Friday shoppers arrived in huge numbers at a Walmart parking lot in Reno, Nevada on November the 24th of 2016. There was an overflow of cars in the lot, which meant the number of available spaces was low and the tension between frustrated drivers was high. 33-year-old Matthew McGraw became enraged after another car cut him off to claim a parking spot. He got out of his vehicle and angrily confronted the other driver. What started out as a verbal argument rapidly devolved into physical violence. As McGraw proceeded to strike the driver with a metal baton, smashing his windshield and bruising his face. The driver then grabbed his firearm and shot McGraw through the window, killing him. Believing his life to still be in danger, the driver fled the scene. Though he fully cooperated with the authorities during the investigation that followed, the police determined that he'd acted in self-defense and they decided not to charge him. Number 4. Nisha and Shital Tandel Arvin Tandel, a father of four from Palo Alto, California, was charged with two counts of vehicular manslaughter following a traffic accident that claimed the lives of two of his own children. 48-year-old Tandel, his wife and his four daughters aged 12 to 24, were traveling in his Lexus SUV after a busy day of Black Friday shopping. On November the 23rd of 2012, the four siblings had been crammed into the back of the vehicle in order for the family's purchases to fit in the middle row. There were only three seats in the back and 24-year-old Nisha and 20-year-old Shital weren't wearing their seat belts. Tandel, who was driving, had only gotten three hours of sleep the previous night and started showing signs of fatigue. He was drifting in and out of the painted highway lanes and gradually grew nearer to the right-hand shoulder. Meanwhile, a California Highway Patrol officer sat in his cruiser, which was parked inside the shoulder. He'd been assisting a couple who was struggling with a flat tire. Tandell's SUV plowed into the rear of the police car and flipped over, rolling as many as seven times before coming to a halt. Everyone involved in the collision was taken to the hospital with injuries. The police officer was about to exit his vehicle when the crash occurred. Had he done so, he would have undoubtedly been killed, but he instead suffered wounds that weren't deemed life-threatening. Nisha and Chital Tandell were both ejected from the SUV during the accident. The former was pronounced dead at the scene while Chital passed away at the hospital. Arvind Tandell was charged following his daughter's deaths, but the Santa Clara County District Attorney chose not to seek jail time in the resulting court proceedings. Number 3. Walter Vance a target in Logan County, West Virginia, was overrun by Black Friday shoppers on November the 25th of 2011. As the customer stampeded through the store, 61-year-old Walter Vance was caught in the chaos and collapsed to the ground. He suffered from a heart condition and went into cardiac arrest amidst the pandemonium. Even as he lay helplessly on the floor, frantic shoppers largely ignored him. Some even stepped over the suffering man to continue shopping. There were nurses at the scene and they eventually came to Vance's aid, performing CPR until paramedics arrived. Unfortunately, Vance passed away at the hospital. It's unclear whether his chances of survival would have improved if someone had helped him sooner. Number 2. Jemaitai Damore Just before 5am on Black Friday 2008, a Walmart in Long Island, New York, 
prepared to open its doors to the public. Before doing so, however, store employees formed a human barricade just inside the entrance to preemptively slow down the flow of shoppers waiting on the sidewalk outside. There were roughly 2,000 people in total awaiting Walmart's opening. Once the doors were finally unlocked, the mass of customers spilled into the store, trampling over the helpless employees, fruitlessly trying to slow them down. Among the workers knocked to the ground was 34-year-old Jemaitai Damor, who gasped for air as the reckless mob continued to crush him. Many of his co-workers attempted to come to his aid, but they had to fight off a seemingly endless influx of shoppers to get to him. Paramedics were called to the scene, but even first responders found it difficult to perform CPR on Damore without getting stepped on and knocked about by the crowd of people. Even after Damore had passed away on the floor of the Walmart, shoppers continued their frenzied search for discounted items. The entrance doors to the store were ripped from their hinges during the rampage, and four other people were injured, including a woman who was eight months pregnant. Police struggled to find any individual they could hold criminally accountable. After examining the store's surveillance tapes, Walmart itself was fined a mere $7,000 for failing to provide the store with adequate security measures. Number 1. Ashley Harris In the early hours of November 28, 2014, the assistant manager of an American Eagle store in Fort Worth, Texas, went home after working an overnight Black Friday shift. It was roughly 3 a.m. when Ashley Harris got back to her apartment and a friend of hers stopped by for a brief visit. The meetup marked the last time Harris was ever seen alive. Soon after her friend's departure, the 31-year-old store manager was accosted by two former employees of hers, 25-year-old Carter Cervantes and her boyfriend, Clarence Mallory, age 19. Both Cervantes and Mallory had previously been fired from Harris's American Eagle location after being suspected of stealing $18,000 from the store's safe. The two assailants came to Harris's apartment and proceeded to beat her. They bound her hands and feet, then set her body and the house on fire. They took her store keys with the intention of breaking in and stealing the Black Friday profits, which were projected to have been around $50,000. Firefighters responding to a fire alarm arrived at Harris's apartment hours after the attack and discovered her body. Cervantes and Mallory were later arrested and charged with capital murder. During their trials, Harris's neighbor testified to hearing screams and crashes coming from her apartment that night. He saw a black Infiniti G35, which was later identified as Cervantes' car, driving away from the scene after the door to Harris's apartment had been slammed shut. The two disgruntled former employees were also caught on the American Eagle surveillance CCTV cameras, trying to unlock the doors to the store at 2 a.m. the following morning. After it was discovered that Harris's keys had been taken from her apartment, the store changed its locks so Cervantes and Mallory were unsuccessful in their attempts to gain access to the safe. Both of them were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 8. Jamakira Ulisa Levert Chapman Workers and patients at the Blake Hospital in Bradenton, Florida spotted a woman that appeared to be loading up a firearm as she sat in the emergency room in June of 2022. The suspect was identified as 37-year-old Jemakira Ulisa Levert Chapman, and she was seen placing bullets into a magazine that was in her purse. Staff discreetly notified the authorities and they arrived at the emergency room within minutes. By then, Levert Chapman had already been approached by a security guard. She was taken into custody and while her intentions were unclear, the weapon and ammo found in her possession were deemed capable of causing considerable destruction. Levert Chapman had a Smith & Wesson 380 caliber semi-automatic handgun with an incorporated laser. Her purse also contained a high-capacity drum-style magazine loaded with 36 rounds, two magazines containing a total of 13 rounds as well as an additional 14 loose rounds. Levert Chapman was charged with introducing a firearm into a hospital and possession of a concealed weapon without a concealed weapon permit. Law enforcement praised the staff's handling of the situation, with a spokesperson later telling the media that everyone did what they're supposed to do. Number 7. Nesta Hernandez In early November of 2022, police in Dallas, Texas released harrowing footage of a shooting in the emergency room of the Methodist 
Dallas Medical Center, which was carried out on October the 22nd by a parolee named Nesta Hernandez. The incident started while he was in the delivery room with his girlfriend, who had given birth the previous day. Hernandez was at the time on parole after serving six years of an eight-year sentence for a 2015 aggravated robbery. He was wearing an ankle monitor, and the Texas Department of Criminal Justice had allowed him to be with his partner for the delivery of their baby. While in the room, Hernandez flew into a jealous rage and accused the woman of cheating on him. He produced a handgun and struck her in the head multiple times with it, before telling her that they were both going to die as was anyone who walked into the room. Much of what followed was captured on the body cam of Methodist Medical System Sergeant Robert Rangel, who was investigating a separate incident when the shots rang out. Hernandez had gunned down social worker Jacqueline Pocour, aged 45, when she walked in to provide assistance to his girlfriend. He then fatally shot 63-year-old nurse Katie Annette Flowers in the hallway. Wrangle quickly drew his weapon and returned fire, hitting Hernandez in the leg and preventing him from leaving the room. The parolee barricaded himself inside with his girlfriend and their newborn, who'd become hostages in his rampage. Wrangle took cover in a spot that provided a vantage point to the delivery room door called for backup and then attempted to talk Hernandez down. As the latter's girlfriend was screaming and wailing, the officer pleaded with him to let her and the baby go safely. More officers eventually gathered around the room entrance and after a standoff lasting 15 minutes, moved in and took Hernandez into custody. Only audio of the apprehension was available. Hernandez was charged with capital murder and aggravated assault against a public servant and held in lieu of a $3 million bond in the Dallas County Jail. Number 6. Glenda Johnson Jackson 65-year-old Texas woman Glenda Johnson Jackson was brought to the emergency room of HCA Healthcare Conroe in June of 2022 for a mental health evaluation after she'd caused a disturbance at a local business. She was placed on a gurney in the hallway with her arms and legs secured. Deputies had failed to find a small caliber firearm, which Johnson Jackson had concealed in a waistband style holster under her dress. The woman got a hold of the pistol and squeezed off two rounds before an EMS worker successfully wrestled the weapon away from her. The unnamed paramedic was hailed as a hero by law enforcement who claimed the intervention likely saved innocent lives. No one was hurt in the shooting and Johnson Jackson was medically cleared to be booked at the Montgomery County Jail. She faced charges of felony deadly conduct and a misdemeanor count of unlawful carrying of a weapon in a prohibited place. Number 5. Ashkan Amir Soleimani A 35-year-old man went on a stabbing spree at the Encino Hospital Medical Center in California's San Fernando Valley. On June the 3rd of 2022, Ashkan Amir Soleimani, whom witnesses claimed appeared to be under the influence of narcotics, parked his car in the middle of the street and then entered the hospital armed with a three to four inch knife. Amir Soleimani, who was agitated and sweating profusely, demanded treatment for anxiety in the emergency room and then proceeded to brutally stab a doctor and two nurses. Two of the victims were subsequently pronounced as being in stable condition after being treated as a trauma center. The third, a male nurse, had been stabbed by Amir Soleimani so badly that according to one witness, his guts were out. He was left with critical injuries but was stabilized after receiving life-saving surgery. Parham Sadat, a dental hygienist who works nearby and his colleague Faraz Faranik, ran across the street to help the victims as they emerged from the hospital. Sadat described the scene as a bloodbath. He then closed the storage room door to keep Amir Soleimani contained inside. Sadat later told a media outlet that he'd made eye contact with the suspect who seemed emotionless as he peered back at him through the window. Responding, law enforcement sealed off the hospital and Amir Soleimani took refuge in one of the rooms. He was captured without further incident after a standoff lasting several hours. He was charged with three counts of attempted murder and held on a $3 million bond. The police were familiar with Amir Soleimani as he had a documented history of violence that included being detained 
for battery on a police officer and resisting arrest the previous year. Number four, Beth Keegstrup. Northern California ER doctor Beth Keegstrup was suspended from all the hospitals at which she worked following an incident that took place on June the 11th of 2018 at El Camino Hospital in Los Gatos. 20-year-old Samuel Bardwell had been rushed to the emergency room after collapsing during basketball practice. The young man had been diagnosed with PTSD, suffered from anxiety attacks, and was taking the drug clonopin, but hadn't been able to get his prescription for several days. Bardwell's father recorded Keegstra on his cell phone as she interacted with the young man while he was lying on the gurney after he'd been waiting for a doctor for three hours. Bardwell was dealing with a severe anxiety attack and was unable to rise to his feet. Keegstra pulled on his arm and ordered him up, telling him he was the least sick of all the people in the ER. She then started mocking Bardwell by asking if he wanted to be wheeled to his home in the gurney. Keegstra wrongfully assumed that he was on drugs and asked him if he was looking to get narcotics. But Bardwell clarified that all he wanted was a pain reliever and anxiety medication. When he told Keegstra that he was unable to inhale properly, she scoffed and replied by saying, he can't inhale? Wow, he must be dead. Are you dead, sir? The doctor was also heard cursing at Bardwell several times before the video ended. No drugs were found in his system, and as a result, he was given some fluids, supplements, and pain medication. Bardwell recovered and decided to share the footage out of concern that other patients would be treated the same by Keegstra. The clip subsequently went viral, with many users condemning her behavior, which subsequently became the focus of an internal investigation. Number 3. Miles Jackson 27-year-old Miles Jackson was taken to the emergency room at Mount Carmel St. Anne's Hospital in Westerville, Ohio, after he was found passed out in a nearby parking lot. The incident occurred on April the 12th of 2021 and Jackson had been taken to the same hospital earlier in the day but had walked out. During his second visit, the man was met by Columbus police officers because of outstanding city warrants for his arrest. A struggle ensued when they discovered that Jackson had a gun concealed in his sweatpants, an aspect that local police had critically missed during the initial pat-down. The gun went off in the melee triggering a standoff between Jackson and the police. He was reported to have shot the weapon two more times, prompting two Columbus police officers and four local police officers to return fire. They shot Jackson 20 times, hitting him in the thighs, backside, abdomen, chest, chin, and ears. He was pronounced dead in the emergency room. Protests followed the shooting with allegations of police brutality, as it was regarded as another example of racial injustice since Jackson, a black man, had been gunned down by white officers. An investigation was launched and no charges were ultimately brought against them, with the exculpatory crux of the matter being that Jackson had fired his weapon three times in the emergency room prior to being killed. Number 2. Melissa Ann Kennedy Fegley Florida woman Melissa Ann Kennedy Fegley was arrested at an ER in Summerfield, following an incident in which she'd pepper-sprayed a male friend in the spring of 2021. She'd been a passenger in the man's vehicle when he'd reportedly told her that he was moving away. An argument ensued that culminated with 54-year-old Fegley deploying her pepper spray at the man. The victim suffered chemical burns to his face and arms. When Fegley was approached by deputies at the Ocala Health Summerfield ER, she admitted to pepper spraying the victim but claimed to have done so because he'd been driving erratically, causing her to hit her head on the dashboard. Fegley was arrested for domestic battery, exhibiting damage to her face in her mugshot and a redness that was potentially indicative of her also being affected by the pepper spray. Fegley claimed that she and the victim had stopped several times while driving through Marion County because the vehicle had overheated due to his rough driving. Officers noted that she had had several opportunities to separate herself from the man but had chosen not to. Number 1. 
Devonta Willis. Tennessee man Devonta Willis faced dozens of counts of aggravated arson in February of 2022, following an incident at Methodist South Hospital in Memphis. On February the 20th, under unspecified circumstances, 35-year-old Willis became irate in the emergency room. He used a cigarette lighter to set fire to a mattress, then witnesses saw him open valves on two oxygen tanks, threatening to blow up the hospital. As later indicated by an affidavit, staff and officers had to evacuate patients and personnel out of concerns that the fire would spread. Memphis police then moved in to take Willis into custody, at which point he became combative, threatening to set them on fire as well. He was ultimately subdued and charged with 59 counts of aggravated arson, vandalism of property between $10,000 and $60,000 and resisting official detention. The fire and smoke had caused considerable damage to the room and its contents, but fortunately, no one was hurt. Number seven, Keyshawn Newell. In 2016, a gang member's mother reported him to the police after hearing him brag about murdering a teenager who'd previously assisted him in a bank robbery. 19-year-old Keyshawn Newell and Jeffrey Doss, age 22, had robbed a citizen's bank in Northfield Village, Ohio, on August the 15th. The men, both reported members of the Black Disciples Street Gang, had recruited 17-year-old Brianna Fluitt to help them. However, within a few days, surveillance photos of her robbing the bank were made public. Newell and Doss became concerned that she would turn on them upon being questioned by the police. Four days after the robbery, Newell picked Fluid up from her home in a stolen SUV alongside three other teenagers. He told them to switch seats with him so that he could make out with her. They drove to East Cleveland where Newell executed Fluid. He shot her two times in the SUV and three more times as she lay dying on the ground outside of the vehicle. Newell's mother contacted the police after he'd bragged about the killing. The teenagers provided the authorities with evidence against him in exchange for their charges to be kept in the juvenile court. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 49 years. Number six, Katie Price. In 2019, British celebrity Katie Price faced a considerable degree of public backlash and was accused of making light of drunk driving. The former model's pink Range Rover had crashed on October the 10th of the previous year. Price was found in the back seat and, upon being questioned by the police, claimed that one of her friends had been driving the vehicle, after which they'd fled the scene. She didn't, however, provide the authorities with the name of said friend, which led to speculation about her story being a fabrication. Price was reportedly nearly twice the legal limit as the Range Rover crashed into a hedge and a parked vehicle in London. No one was hurt, but the incident was just one of many legal issues involving Price's driving in the past, some of which included speeding, running a red light and driving while on her cell phone. For the latest incident, she wasn't found to be a credible witness and was ultimately given a three-month driving ban on the lesser charge of being drunk while in charge of a motor vehicle. She celebrated her conviction outside the courthouse, claiming, Brilliant! I thought I was going to get two years! Price was seen pumping her fist in the air and boasted that she was going to go car shopping. The public viscerally reacted to her attitude. One woman, whose teenage daughter had been killed in a drunk driving incident, called it disgusting and a way of trivializing a serious issue. Price was also accused of setting a bad example and of getting off with a lighter sentence simply because of her celebrity status. Number 5. Blake Fisher in October of 2018, an Idaho Fish and Game Commissioner resigned from his position amidst controversy regarding his recent hunting trip to Namibia. In mid-September, he'd sent an email with photos bragging about his expedition to over 100 colleagues and friends. The images showed Fisher and his wife standing next to the bodies of various kills which included a leopard, an oryx, a giraffe, a water buck, and perhaps most worrisome, an entire baboon family. Fisher boasted that he'd killed the latter as a way of introducing his wife to hunting in Africa, claiming that she got the idea quick. Many of his colleagues found the images and the callous tone of the email unsettling. Former commissioners of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game spoke out against what they believed to be 
a lurid perspective on hunting and an attitude that tarnished the department's reputation. They called for Fisher to resign, which he did, but told the Boise newspaper that he didn't feel he'd done anything unethical and immoral. Number 4. Arthur Tomawayak While intoxicated, Arthur Tomawayak crashed his Mercedes S600 into another vehicle and killed its occupant. Only seconds after boasting to a passenger about his drug driving skills. In October of 2018, Tomawayak was speeding down Mort Lane in Tildesley, Manchester. He was doing over 70 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour area when he collided with a Volkswagen Golf. 71 year old Kathleen Brogan was a front seat passenger while her daughter Jill was behind the wheel. The Golf spun 180 degrees and was hurled tens of feet back up the road. Brogan was killed while Jill was rushed to the hospital with fractures to both legs and to her pelvis. 39-year-old Tom Wyeck suffered internal injuries, as did his passenger, Zygmunt Putek. The audio from dashcam footage revealed a conversation between the two men. Putek had repeatedly asked Tom Wyeck to slow down, claiming that he had children, to which the latter replied, I'm a better driver when I've had a drink. Moments later, he crashed into the Volkswagen. Earlier that day, Tom Wyeck had downed a third of a whiskey bottle and was double the legal alcohol limit. He pled guilty to causing death and serious injury by dangerous driving, for which he was sentenced to 88 months in prison and banned from driving for nine years and 10 months. Number three, murder of Daniel Halseth. On April the 9th of 2021, the body of 45-year-old Daniel Halseth was found burnt from head to toe in the garage of his Las Vegas home. Prior to being stuffed into a sleeping bag and set ablaze, He'd been stabbed and cut at least 70 times. There were also wounds on his body to suggest attempted dismemberment. The police was only hours into the investigation when they were approached by the parents of 18-year-old Aaron Guerrero. They were concerned that he'd run away with Halseth's daughter, Sierra, also in her late teens. She and Guerrero had been dating between June and December of 2020, but their parents then kept them apart after finding out about their plan to run away to Los Angeles together. As the investigation progressed, it was revealed that Sierra had used her father's debit cards. Surveillance cameras from local stores had captured her and Guerrero buying disposable gloves, a circular saw, and saw blades, bleach, and lighter fluid. Many of the items were found at the crime scene, along with a handsaw and two folding knives. It's believed that Sierra and Guerrero murdered Halseth and then tried burning the body in parts of the house to cover their tracks. The two had fled to Salt Lake City, where they were arrested on April the 13th. In the aftermath, the authorities found a disturbing video on YouTube of Sierra and Guerrero apparently bragging about the murder. The couple appeared to be inside a tent as Guerrero boasted to the camera, Welcome back to our YouTube channel, day three after murdering somebody, as they each held three fingers up. Sierra then told Guerrero not to say that on camera before he cradled her head and claimed that it had been worth it. Their trial is ongoing, but some reports claimed that prosecutors pondered pursuing the death penalty for Guerrero. The teens both pled not guilty. Number 2. Twain Gotti In July of 2013, a rapper was charged with double homicide after boasting in his lyrics about slaying a rival gang member. The case had gone cold for the 2007 murders of 16-year-old Christopher Horton and Brian Dean, aged 20, who'd been gunned down on the porch of a Virginia home. Then, in 2011, a break came after a detective newly assigned to the case was tipped off about a YouTube song called Ride Out, performed by 22-year-old local rapper Antoine Stewart, also known as Twain Gotti. He was reportedly becoming prominent on the music scene, having released several mixtapes, performing in East Coast shows and signing with a New York-based management firm. In the song that allegedly referenced Horton's killing, he bragged how everyone had seen when he choked him on the porch, but he goes on to imply there were no witnesses when he smoked him and 357 Smith & Wesson scoped him. Roughly one year after the charges, Stewart was acquitted of the double murder but instead got 16 years for additional charges stemming from the shooting. They were two use of a firearm counts and one for shooting into an occupied dwelling. Stewart stated an intention of appealing the sentence. His conviction refueled conversations about First Amendment rights and if rap lyrics, on which most of the case against Stewart have been built, are entirely protected by 
freedom of speech or if they may be used as evidence. Number 1. Jorge Avia Torres On July the 12th of 2009, a welfare check was performed at the Joint Base Maya Henderson Hall in Arlington, Virginia, after Navy Petty Officer Second Class Amanda Snell failed to turn up for her shift. The door was unlocked while her purse and ID were still in the room. Snell's decomposing body was found inside a closet and it was ultimately determined that the 20-year-old had been killed through some form of strangulation. DNA samples were taken from the scene and because of how tightly monitored the base was, the killer was suspected to have been stationed there. For months, none of the leads had panned out until February of 2010. Following the kidnapping of three women in Arlington, their aggressor had taken them at gunpoint and bound them with electrical cords in their Ballston apartment. He then took one of the victims to a secluded area in his SUV, repeatedly choked and abused her before leaving her for dead next to a highway. She survived, as did the others, and they were able to provide the authorities with a description of the vehicle and their aggressor. The information consequently led them to Jorge Avia Torres. He was a Marine who lived at the base just two doors down from Snell. A search of his vehicle tied him to the February attack, while his DNA was found to match samples recovered from that crime scene as well as from the bedsheets in Snell's room. Following Torres' arrest, his cellmate, Osama El Atari, approached the authorities claiming that he'd been bragging about killing Snell. El Atari was serving time for defrauding several banks of an estimated $53 million and agreed to wear a wire in exchange for a lesser sentence. It would subsequently provide investigators with a chilling record of Torres describing how he'd tied Snell up with a cable from her laptop and choked her to death. The DNA evidence, coupled with the jailhouse confession, was enough to secure a conviction, but the series of gruesome revelations was far from over. After running his DNA through a database, Torres was connected to a horrific 2005 double homicide in his hometown of Zion, Illinois, when he was still in his late teens. The victims had been abused, killed, and their eyeballs had been cut out of their sockets. It's believed that he joined the Marines to lower suspicions. He was sentenced to death for Snell's murder as well as the double homicide and is currently awaiting execution at USP Terre Haute. Number 9. Lucas Dudley In 2020, a hunter was fatally shot in northern Minnesota after he was mistaken for a deer. The incident took place at around 7 p.m. and according to the Beltrami County Sheriff's Office, 28-year-old Lucas Dudley wasn't wearing any high visibility gear. Dudley was presumably trying to keep a low profile. He'd been released from jail about a month prior, and a court order prevented him from possessing a weapon, meaning that he was hunted illegally. He was at the Red Lake Reservation where Rain Stately, aged 33, was staking out deer. The dusky conditions and Dudley's lack of brightly colored clothing led to the tragic misidentification. Stately saw movement in the foliage and fired one round from his rifle. Dudley collapsed and died on the spot. Stately approached his target but after realizing what he'd done called 911. It was reported that he fully cooperated with the authorities but it's unclear whether or not he was charged for the shooting. Number 8. Justin Lee Smith In November of 2020, a North Carolina teenager got impaled on his own rifle in a brutal hunting accident. 17-year-old Justin Lee Smith was hunting in the northwest part of Taisho Mingo County, Mississippi. He was in a ladder stand at a height of roughly 10 feet. Smith moved to one side of the platform, causing the balance to shift. He fell from the top and his chest got impaled on the barrel of his rifle. Smith managed to call the emergency services on his cell phone, but succumbed to his injuries soon after. Number 7. Jaden Provost in June of 2013, Jaden Provost set off on a hunting expedition in Australia's Northern Territory, armed with a crossbow he'd recently purchased. The 20-year-old heard some commotion in a bush and ran towards it with the crossbow pointing down. Suddenly, he found it difficult to move forward. When he looked down, Provost realized that he'd accidentally shot himself through the foot with the bolt tip protruding out the sole of his flip-flop. He hopped back to the homestead where he was working at the time, hit the crossbow, and tried to conceal the injury from his employer. Provost remembered that he hadn't spilled a drop of blood and, aside from intense throbbing, didn't feel much pain either. Understandably, it wasn't long before his employer noticed the arrow sticking out of his foot. 
he was taken to Catherine Hospital on an hour and a half drive. Upon arrival, doctors, nurses and paramedics all reportedly wanted to have their picture taken with this unusual injury. The arrow was removed, but due to nerve damage, Provost had trouble walking for a few weeks. Number 6. Michaela Alexis Rettinger On April the 28th of 2019, a young woman from Waterloo, Iowa, was fatally shot while driving her car through a wooded area on Highway 218. 25-year-old Michaela Alexis Rettinger was behind the wheel of a Jeep while her partner, Adam Kimball, was on the passenger side and another adult was in the back seat. At around 2.30 a.m., a bullet shattered the driver's window and struck Rettinger through the neck. It then hit 32-year-old Kimball in the face, becoming lodged in his tongue. The other passenger was unharmed. Rettinger succumbed to her gunshot wound while Kimball survived. He was treated at a local hospital and was unable to speak for a few days. The police determined that none of those present in the vehicle had been involved in any activities to suggest they'd been the victims of a targeted attack. The leading theory was that they'd been struck by a stray bullet from someone hunting in the area. An investigation was launched, but as of April 2021, two years since the unexplained incident, the shooter hadn't been found. Number 5. James Pace In August of 2013, Connecticut man James Pace accidentally shot himself in the shin while hunting a raccoon. The 81-year-old from New Haven was determined to kill the animal, which had been routinely scratching at his back door. Pace took his position in a chair armed with a 22 caliber rifle and waited for the raccoon to wander back onto his property. At one point, the elderly man sneezed, which caused him to fall from his chair and accidentally fire the weapon into his leg. Pace's son took him to Yale New Haven Hospital, where he was treated for a gunshot wound that wasn't deemed life-threatening. Number 4. Rosemary Bilquist A day before Thanksgiving in 2017, a woman was killed while walking her dog after a neighbor mistook her for a deer. 43-year-old Rosemary Bilquist and her pet were out on a field in the town of Sherman, New York. Her neighbor, Thomas Jedlowski, was deer hunting well after sunset, which legally marked the closing of the hunting day. Jadlowski remembered being about 200 yards from what he thought was one of the animals he'd been tracking. He fired his pistol and struck Bilquist in the hip, after which he heard her cry out. Jadlowski got close to the woman and called the authorities upon realizing the grave confusion that had occurred. Police reported that he was in an emotional state when they interviewed him. Bilquist was rushed to a local hospital where she was later pronounced dead. Her husband demanded accountability and Jadlowski was initially charged with second-degree manslaughter, which carried a maximum sentence of 15 years in prison. He eventually pled guilty to criminally negligent homicide and was sentenced to one to three years. Number 3. Karl Rubisch In 2013, Karl Rubisch and a friend were on a nighttime rabbit hunting trip near Brockton in Shropshire, England. Just like his father, who was a member of the British Falconers Club, 30-year-old Rubisch was an avid hunter. Unfortunately, while on the Friday night trip, he would suffer a fatal accident. As he was walking through a farm gate, Rubisch's weapon discharged and he was struck with a single round. His friend, who chose not to be identified, ran to a nearby house and asked the owner to call an ambulance. Paramedics arrived at the scene, but they were unable to save him. Rubisch's wife and mother to his two young children, whom he'd married less than a year prior, was reported as inconsolable in the incident's aftermath. Number 2. Andrew Smith On December the 2nd of 2020, Bradley Smith was hunting for a white-tailed deer outside of Delaware, Ohio, alongside his 28-year-old son, Andrew. They were with a group of experienced hunters, friends who had been meeting up at the spot for over two decades. According to Ohio's Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife, hunters are legally required to wear bright orange half an hour before sunrise and after sunset. Daylight turned to dusk and Andrew wasn't equipped with the necessary clothing. As he was moving through the forest, he was shot by his own father, who thought he'd spotted a deer. Andrew was pronounced dead at the scene. A spokesman for the sheriff's office told the media it's just the worst kind of tragedy, while the authorities said that Bradley wouldn't be charged for the shooting. Number 1. Chai Vang on November the 21st of 2004, Chai Vang shot and killed six hunters following a dispute on a hunting trip in northern Wisconsin. Vang, a naturalized Hmong American, 
originally from Laos, was a veteran of the California National Guard. That weekend, the 36-year-old had gone deer hunting along with two friends and their sons at a popular spot east of Birchwood. It's believed that they'd started their expedition on public land before moving into an area owned by Terry Willis. He had been hunting alongside a party of 15 who were in a cabin on the private land. Willis found Vang in a deer stand and asked him to leave. He then radioed the cabin, claiming he'd disposed of a tree rat and some of the others got in their terrain vehicles. They caught up with Vang further down the trail, intending to get the number of his hunting license and let him know that he wasn't welcome. When they arrived, Bob Criteau from Willis' group flipped over the tag on Vang's back to get his license. A verbal altercation ensued in which racial slurs were reportedly uttered towards Vang. It then turned explosively violent, but the circumstances are disputed. Vang claimed that Willis had shot at him first from about 100 feet away, which triggered his defensive response. However, no casing was recovered from Willis' gun. By his own admission, Vang had removed the scope from his rifle before releasing his first shot and then progressively gunning down the other hunters. Willis, the only armed person in his group, was struck in the lower neck as he dove for cover and was left paralyzed. Vang then aimed at the men on the ATVs, mowing down two of them. From close range, he fired three rounds at 48-year-old Lauren Hesseback. As he chased him around a UTV, he then went in pursuit of Bob Croteau and shot him dead, but not before he got the chance to radio the cabin for help. By the time two other hunters arrived on an ATV, Vang had also killed Croteau's 20-year-old son. The killer turned his orange jacket to its camouflage side and waited to ambush the others. Riding on the back of the arriving ATV was Willis's 27-year-old daughter, Jessica. Vang shot her in the back and the round pierced through her hip and into the driver's lower spine. Vang got near and executed both of them at close range. He then saw Hesbeck moving as he went to retrieve his scope. Vang approached him and reportedly said, You not dead yet? Hesbeck grabbed Willis's rifle with shots flying past him. He fired it once but missed, unable to properly aim it due to his wounds. Vang then fled the scene after his weapon had run out of bullets. Only Hesbeck and Willis survived his onslaught. Following his arrest, Vang tried to claim self-defense in court, even stating that some of his victims deserved to die. He was sentenced to six life terms plus 70 years. Number 8. Brandon Wilson In September of 2017, Brandon Wilson then, in his late teens, broke into a house where he once lived as a foster child in Woodbury, South Jersey. Wilson had intended to burglarize the residence but was surprised to find 26-year-old Shawnique Carter, who was house-sitting for a friend, inside. He bludgeoned her with a metal bar from a gym weight and then stabbed her to death. Wilson tried to cover his tracks by cleaning up the scene before fleeing. Carter's body was found in a second-floor bedroom by her five-year-old son and his cousin, also aged five. They then wandered to a barber shop up the street and reported what they'd seen. In the two-month-long investigation that followed, surveillance footage from another house on the street as well as physical evidence placed Wilson at the scene. He was charged while in custody at Cape May County Jail. In an unrelated case stemming from his extensive criminal record, his parents, David Wilson and Kim Ward, both in their early 50s, soon became part of the investigation as well. A shoe print was found on the premises and detectives contacted the jail asking staff to remove Wilson's footwear for inspection. The suspect reportedly called his parents from jail and asked them to get rid of two pairs of shoes from their home. When officers arrived at their Paulsboro address, they recovered two pairs of sneakers from an attic and realized that they were wet and smelled of cleaning solution. David and Kim would subsequently plead guilty to hindering a third-degree charge that could result in a maximum sentence of five years, whereas Wilson was given 54 years in prison for Carter's murder. Number 7. Zachary Craven in August of 2018, Washington man Zachary Craven, aged 27, was sentenced to 72 years in prison for a double homicide that had occurred several years earlier. Craven had been raised by his grandmother, Angelica Hayden, who'd maintained a loving relationship with him even as his life had begun spiraling out of control due to his methamphetamine addiction. She'd hoped he'd recover even after he'd committed multiple assaults against her, including one that involved killing her cat and another in which he bound her hands with electrical cord, demanding she give him money. He was charged with assault and a no-contact order was put in place to protect Hayden. On July the 7th of 2015, Craven went to her home in Skyway and fatally shot her in the head. He then headed towards the Renton home of his ex-girlfriend, Teresa Cunningham, undoubtedly 
with the intention of killing her as well. However, she and her family were away and house-sitting for them was Cunningham's best friend, Megan Smith, aged 21. Craven arrived at the residence and, upon encountering Smith, demanded a piggy bank that he and Cunningham used to share. He then executed Smith as well as his ex-girlfriend's elderly dog in the kitchen. About a week before his killing spree, Craven had failed to show up for court-ordered transportation to a drug treatment clinic. Smith's family would subsequently sue the Department of Corrections for what was deemed as a poor job of monitoring him, even though he was a convicted felon and an addict with a history of mental illness. Number 6. Valerie Graves On December 30th of 2013, a British woman was killed while house-sitting for friends at a waterfront property in the East Sussex village of Bosham. The owners had gone abroad for Christmas, leaving 55-year-old Valerie Graves, who lived in nearby Brackelsham Bay, to watch the home, estimated at over $2 million. Graves' body was discovered by one of her relatives in a ground-floor bedroom. She'd suffered fatal injuries after being bludgeoned with a claw hammer which was found less than half a mile from the property. Forensic analysis of DNA recovered from the scene established the killer was male, but for several years no suspects were identified. The police launched a massive DNA voluntary screening that examined over 3,000 men before ultimately fearing that the killer might never be caught. The crucial break in the case would come from a woman living in a rural part of Romania's Transylvania region. While looking through her husband's phone, 27-year-old Claudia Sabau had found Google searches about a murder in Bosham and a media released picture of a hammer which looked like the one he had. She confronted her husband, Christian, who asked her not to break up with him and to keep quiet about the matter. Claudia, however, contacted British authorities. Before returning to Romania, Christian and his wife had been living in a caravan at a scrapyard along the A27. In Chichester, Sabal had done odd jobs at the home where Graves was killed. On the night of her death, he'd drunk a bottle of whiskey and cycled to the address. He'd broken in, expecting to find the place empty, with the intention of stealing from a safe he'd believed to hold money and precious ingots. He found Graves inside him, bludgeoned her to death, fearing she'd be able to identify him. Christian was arrested in his home country on a street that was named after Vlad the Impaler, where he'd been living with a new girlfriend and extradited to England. DNA evidence confirmed his estranged wife's early detective work, and he pleaded guilty to killing Graves in 2019. Number 5. Karen Smallwood on October the 13th of 2004, while house-sitting for her aunt and uncle in New Mexico, 19-year-old mother of one, Ursula Duran, was shot dead. Her body was discovered by her boyfriend, also the father of her child, and by her mother, who then alerted the authorities. The young woman had been shot five times, twice at close range, and there were some grey hair strands clutched in her hand, presumably belonging to her attacker. Eleven days after the murder, the aunt and uncle revealed that some items had been taken from their home, including Duran's ATM card and checkbook. The card was used at cash machines in New Mexico, Texas, and Arkansas before a final withdrawal occurred in Louisiana. Video from one of the ATMs showed an older woman, whom the aunt and uncle would identify as Karen Smallwood, who used to house sit for them. The 59-year-old had been living at a campground at the edge of town and, after a long time of not speaking with them, had contacted the couple to ask if they needed a house sitter. They said no, adding that their niece was taking care of the home. The police found a DNA match between Smallwood and the hair strands from the scene, while recovered casings proved to be of the same type as those of a 9mm handgun in her possession. Blood found inside the said gun was positively matched to Duran's. Smallwood was consequently sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years served. Number 4. Rebecca McCurdy While house-sitting at an address in Osage County, Oklahoma, a mother of two was the victim of a brutal dog attack in June of 2021. Deputies from the sheriff's office were asked to perform a wellness check at the residence just west of Skiatook. It was there that they found the lifeless body of house-sitter Rebecca McCurdy, aged 28, who'd been mauled to death by a pit bull. There were several caged dogs which the owner claimed to be raising for profit in the garage. One of the cages was toppled over and, aside from the injuries on McCurdy's body, further evidence pointed to a dog attack. It's unclear what charges, if any, the owner would face. A GoFundMe was subsequently set up in McCurdy's name meant to offer support to her family. Number 3. Elizabeth Bischoff In May of 2019, Police were called to a home in the Broadmoor neighborhood of Colorado Springs to the report of a theft. The homeowner, who chose not to disclose her identity, had had a broken arm for a few months and thus 
hadn't been wearing any jewelry. When she went to put on her Rolex, she realized that the watch, along with several other custom pieces, was missing. There were no signs of forced entry to indicate a break-in. The main suspect was 39-year-old Elizabeth Bischoff, a known dog and house sitter in the area, from whose services the homeowner had also benefited. Bischoff had sold $400,000 worth of jewelry to a company in Denver, claiming that she'd inherited the pieces. Upon examining the diamonds, the jewelers realized that they'd been custom cut in a particular store from New York. Further communication between the two companies revealed that Bischoff's pieces had actually been stolen. She was arrested in October and still had about $200,000 worth of jewelry in her possession, which she'd stashed away at a different home where she was pet-sitting, unbeknownst to the owners. In the aftermath, Bischoff faced charges of second-degree burglary and theft. Number 2. Michael Robles and Monica Caban On July the 1st of 2020, a homeowner from Alamo Heights, Texas, called the local police department to report that her house had basically been stripped of its interior. Michael Robles and Monica Caban, both in their early 40s, were arrested and charged with theft of $150,000 to $300,000. The aptly dubbed House Sitters from Hell had been hired to watch the home while the owner was in Australia. During that time, they removed all interior doors, granite countertops from the kitchen, the oven, washer, dryer, window blinds, and even cabinets. Robles and Caban attempted to extract the windows and the air conditioning unit through a makeshift scaffold. The authorities reported that the house had been left in a dilapidated and unlivable condition after even items that were nailed down or attached to piping had been ripped from their supports. Aside from theft, Robles and Caban were also charged with three counts of drug possession with intent to sell and held at Bexar County Jail on a $25,000 bail. Number 1. Jacob Eveland on May the 31st, a man in Elmer, Washington was stabbed, shot, and burned to death by a friend who'd been freshly released from jail. 47-year-old Roy Jones had been house-sitting for Jacob Eveland while he was doing a 30-day jail stint for domestic violence assault. Jones, his grandmother, was the one who'd driven him to the house on the night. She remembered waving at Eveland, who'd been released that same day before leaving. The next morning, she turned on the news and saw the house on fire, with reports claiming that a body who she soon realized was her grandson had been found in the front yard. Evelyn had shot and stabbed Jones before setting his own house ablaze and fleeing the premises. The cause of the murder remained unclear, but Grays Harbor County Sheriff Rick Scott suspected that Evelyn had committed it because of animosity that he had towards Jones over drug usage, drug theft. Evelyn was arrested in Seattle and confessed to the killing, for which he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Before we jump into today's video, this is a friendly reminder that today is April 1st or April Fool's Day, so try not to be tricked or scared by anyone. Number 11. Joseph Rosa In February of 2021, an elevator mechanic suffered a fatal accident in the Bronx borough of New York City. 25-year-old Joseph Rosa was assisting a colleague conduct modernization work on the unit inside a Mount Eden residential building. The elevator abruptly gave away and fell on the mechanic, trapping him beneath its weight at the bottom of the shaft. The cause of the sudden collapse remained to be determined following an investigation. According to tenants of the six-story apartment block, the elevator had been out of service for months. First responders were able to pull Rosa out of the shaft, but the man was unresponsive. In spite of chest compressions and other resuscitation attempts, his condition continued to deteriorate. Rosa, who'd recently gotten married, was pronounced dead shortly after arriving at a Bronx hospital. Number 10. Suzanne Hart In February of 2012, Suzanne Hart was crushed by an elevator at the Manhattan offices of the advertising agency where she worked. A maintenance crew had performed repairs on the unit roughly half an hour before Hart's fatal accident. An investigation revealed that they'd failed to follow a number of crucial safety protocols. They hadn't put up signs informing that repair was in progress and had placed the elevator back in service without proper clearance. While the mechanic was working on the elevator, he overrode the safety mechanism that prevented it from moving with its doors open. The investigation found that it had failed to turn the safety back on, a critical oversight that played a major role in Hart's demise. Moments before the 41-year-old stepped into the cabin, the elevator was called to a higher floor. It accelerated upwards with its doors open, trapping Hart's body. 
Two people inside the cabin watched in horror as the woman was mangled by the machine. The elevator repair company had its license suspended and faced 23 violations, which included a penalty of at least $110,000. Number 9. Samuel Waysbrin In August of 2019, a 30-year-old tech executive suffered a gruesome death following an elevator accident in Manhattan, New York City. Samuel Waysbrin was about to exit the elevator in the lobby of the Manhattan Promenade when it suddenly plummeted towards the basement. Harrowing security camera footage showed Waysbrin desperately struggling to crawl onto the floor. Unfortunately, he was dragged down with the collapsing cabin and fatally crushed between the wall and the elevator shaft. Another man had barely escaped the cabin ahead of him. There were five residents in the elevator as it went down, but they didn't sustain injuries and were subsequently rescued by firefighters. A number of residents of the 23-floor luxury apartment building were left so traumatized by the incident that they avoided using the elevators altogether. They'd been complaining of frequent malfunctions prior to the fatal incident. These included wobbling, getting stuck between floors or doors that didn't fully close. In May, the building had been fined $1,300 after it was found that the safety feature on an elevator separate from the one which killed Waysbrin had been disabled or tampered with. Number 8. Carrie O'Connor In September of 2020, 38-year-old Carrie O'Connor was crushed by an elevator at a Boston apartment building that she'd recently moved into. Located on Commonwealth Avenue, the building reportedly dated back to the 1920s. A neighbor was helping O'Connor move some boxes into her new apartment. He took the stairs, while a woman was trying to move a heavy package into the cabin. The neighbor had reportedly told O'Connor to be careful with the old-fashioned elevator. It worked via a two-door system which, in order for the cabin to start moving, required the second door to be firmly shut. It suspected that the weight of the package had triggered the sensor by fault and the elevator plummeted, dragging O'Connor with it. One neighbor reported hearing an ungodly scream as the accident occurred. O'Connor sustained critical crushing injuries and was pronounced dead at the scene. The neighbor who helped her move had witnessed the incident. He was found in a state of distress, hyperventilating and screaming that the woman was dead. Number 7. Sushila Vishwakarma In May of 2019, an Indian woman suffered a horrific elevator accident at a plastic factory in the city of Vadodara in the state of Gujarat. 48-year-old Sushila Vishwakarma arrived for her shift at 8 a.m. and took the elevator up to the fourth floor, where she was due to start work. As the platform started moving, however, something went horribly wrong. The elevator didn't have a roof, as it was used primarily for the transportation of goods. It's unclear if Vishwakarma's headphones had gotten caught in the unit's grill door or if she'd become distracted by her phone and accidentally stuck her head out. The woman got caught in the moving platform and was decapitated. Her body was dragged to the top, but her head was found on the ground floor. While Vishwakarma's death was treated as accidental, the police stated they'd examined multiple angles, including a potential elevator malfunction. Number 6. Nikolai In 2018, a Russian man was taken on a terrifying ride by a malfunctioning Moscow elevator. The man, only identified as Nikolai, was going to his home on the 26th floor of the residential tower block. After he pressed the button, the elevator surged upwards at alarming speeds and crashed into the top of the shaft on the 40th floor. It then free fell roughly 220 feet, which is close to the height of a giant sequoia, and abruptly halted at the 20th floor, likely due to a safety break. Nikolai sustained injuries to his back and his leg as he was left sprawled on the elevator floor. He had avoided more severe injuries due to a split-second reaction of grabbing a handrail. The elevator then accelerated upwards again and stopped at the top. Realizing he might not get another chance to escape, he forced the doors open and got out. He was described by paramedics as being in deep shock, but survived his ordeal. Number 5. Joyden Joe Harris Malaysian teenager Joyden Joe Harris died on April the 23rd of 2020 after he got stuck between the doors of an elevator. 19-year-old Joe Harris and a colleague were transferring supplies at the supermarket where they worked. Joe Harris, who lived in Inanam with his fiancée, was only a month into the job. 
He used the dolly to transport the goods onto the elevator platform and then to the second floor. Joe Harris was heading back down when the accident occurred. While the exact circumstances remain unclear, the teenager's neck got trapped between the doors as they slammed shut. The pressure exerted on Joe Harris's neck left him in critical condition. A team of firefighters were called to the supermarket and performed cardiopulmonary resuscitation on the teenager. Unfortunately, paramedics would ultimately pronounce him dead at the scene. Number 4. Wu In 2016, a Chinese woman whose family name was given as Wu died of thirst and starvation after she became trapped in an elevator. The incident occurred in the northern city of Xi'an and was attributed to a failure by a maintenance crew to check if the cabin was empty before cutting the power supply to the elevator. The men then went on New Year's holiday, leaving the elevator stuck between the 10th and 11th floor. 43-year-old Wu barely kept in touch with her family and lived alone in the building, which is why her absence went unreported. Some neighbors told the authorities that she suffered from mental health problems, but the claims weren't verified. The elevator crew returned after a month and was shocked to discover Wu's lifeless body inside the elevator, with the cabin walls covered in scratch marks. Several people were arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter in the incident's aftermath. Number 3. Maria Sanchez In December of 2020, a New York grocery store worker passed away following an accident which involved an illegally installed freight elevator. 39-year-old Maria Sanchez worked for the Food Emporium in Hell's Kitchen. She was at cellar level, loading supplies into a small dumb waiter elevator. When the machine malfunctioned and lurched upwards, Sanchez's head was caught between the wall and the moving platform, causing her to suffer fatal crushing injuries. Her lifeless body was found by other workers in the afternoon. Sanchez was survived by her children, aged 5 to 21, whom she worked two jobs in 48-hour weeks to support. An investigation revealed that the elevator was unregistered and didn't have a certificate from the city to attest its safety. The Department of Buildings issued a cease order for the unit and a violation for the building's owner. Today's topic was requested by Instagram follower Shaka Dragon. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below or follow us on Instagram and reach out to us there. Number 2. Unnamed Taiwan Man In 2017, a man only identified as a lecturer at Ilan University in Taiwan got half of his body crushed in a gruesome elevator accident. He was at the university sport complex when he stepped inside the cabin. The lecturer hadn't made it the whole way into the elevator when the doors rapidly closed behind him, trapping his legs outside. The elevator then started to rise, squeezing the man's lower body. Security footage showed that only the top half of the lecturer's body remained inside the elevator, pinned to its floor. In spite of his horrifying predicament, the 45-year-old had the presence of mind to call for help on his cell phone. Firefighters tried for an over an hour to rescue him, but the man eventually succumbed to his extensive injuries. Number 1. Brazilian Family On December the 31st of 2019, four family members died in an elevator crash in the city of Sao Paulo. 47-year-old Juscelina Santos was going up to the ninth floor of a residential building with her sister, Lucienda de Souza Góes and her brother-in-law, Edilson Donizete. The couple, both in their 40s, were also joined by their 19-year-old son, Eric Miguel. They were on their way to celebrate New Year's Eve when the elevator collapsed, killing everyone inside. While an investigation into the accident was launched, preliminary findings indicated that the cabin had become detached from the cable system. A service elevator adjacent to the one that had collapsed was out of service at the time. Santos was married to a Navy officer and the building, erected in 1998, was exclusive to military personnel, according to a tenant who chose to remain anonymous. The elevators would constantly malfunction. The doors wouldn't open. They'd stop between floors and the emergency button reportedly never worked. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be trapped in an elevator as it's plummeting from the third floor or in a car as it's sinking? in the lake. Let us know in the comments section below.